Happy Tuesday, Raider Nation. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original podcast. My name is Scott Branson, your host for today. Mo Moten will be back on Thursday. Yes, uh, he is doing better. We certainly appreciate all the comments, questions, and well wishes from all of you out there. So Mo will be back uh, on Thursday, and we look forward to that. Do us a favor. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, make sure you do it. Again, we are an Odyssey original podcast, one of 32 NFL podcasts, as well as the entire network of Odyssey, whether you're a baseball fan, an NBA fan, college football doesn't matter. We got you covered. But make sure you subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast. You can check it right off our Twitter feed at SNB Today. In our bio is the link. And no matter what format you're on, we'll take you right to the link where you can subscribe. And don't forget, do me a huge favor. I want to be thankful. So be thankful for the show and make sure you put on the auto download. That helps us out a lot. We certainly appreciate that. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, Hit subscription, but also hit notifications. If you hit the notification bell, you will get notified every time we have a new show. That also is significant. That way you don't miss the latest and greatest from us here at Silver and Black. Today, speaking of the latest and greatest, the Raiders win 22-16 to on Sunday in Denver. Uh, of course, we had a lively postgame show. Myself and Murph from Raiders Fan Radio it was great to be able to talk to you guys in the chat on YouTube and then afterwards on social media on Monday morning about that game, what happened, and to see the Raiders perform better. Were they perfect? No. They're 3-7, and seven, okay? They're not 7-3. and three. They got a long way to go. But I will tell you this. So many things came out of that game that I thought were positive. And as a Raider fan, even though you're disappointing with way, disappointed, excuse me, how the season has gone, you have to feel good about that win. Now, for those of you who aren't happy, even when the Raiders win, I don't know what else I can tell you. I can re recommend some good books that can help you like self-help out of it. I know you're tired of losing. I'm not saying get used to it or just accept it. Not what I'm saying, but you have to enjoy when your team wins because uh, obviously, it's been a rough season. It's been a rough several years for this Raiders team with all that has gone on around it. So you got you got to be happy about it. And that's my point is I've been saying it for two weeks now. Find some positives. Well, Sunday, you could find a lot of positives. And I want to break down the show this way. We're going to talk about Derek Carr next segment and the offense and, and what happened on Sunday with that. Because I think there's some significant breakthroughs there that I want to talk about, not only with his play, but with what you're hearing from him, Devontae Adams, and Josh McDaniels, and how that might give us some insight onto how this team is progressing after all the negativity, after the national press just lambasting the Raiders as being the most disappointing team in football, and in many ways they have been, so they deserve it a touch, but just the, the, the outright contempt for Josh McDaniels in the national media because of these high expectations, and then, of course, because of his history— which he exercised some of those demons again Sunday in Denver by beating the Broncos for the second straight time since he came back as a, a head coach with the Raiders, obviously. So, so we're going to talk about that in the second segment. But in this first segment, I want to start off with this, because this, this has been one of the most discussed issues in Raider Nation with this 3-7 and seven season, and that has been the lack of success on defense. The Raiders' defense has been brutal. We, we know they rank near the end the bottom, I should say, in defensive categories all throughout. And we've seen the Raider defense give up those big 17-point uh, leads. Uh, and again, I always argue, complimentary football, yes, the defense hasn't done their job, but then the offense, when given opportunities, hasn't done their job. Well, Sunday in Denver, guess what happened? The defense came to play. The defense not only came to play, but in my view, before the end of the first half, the defense completely changed momentum and set the tone for what would happen in the second half and set this team up to win. I really believe that. I want to get into that a little bit uh, because if you remember, let's, let's go back to Sunday, late second quarter, the Broncos and uh, the Broncos are driving, right? They get down to the three yard line uh, and there's under a minute left. Uh, the Raiders are down 10-7. So if the if the Broncos go in and score, it's going to be a 10-point game, 17-7. to Not only that, key to remember, the Broncos get the ball at halftime. So they would have had a 17-7 lead 
and the ball coming out in the second half. So that's you talk about a lack of momentum and maybe flying in the danger zone a little bit to steal a top gunism. Uh, but that's where they would have been. So the Raiders are down there. The defense, this defense, which is undermanned, we know that, not enough talent on that defense, has had trouble with Patrick Graham's system. Everyone wanted Patrick Graham fired. I thought he might be. He was not. Credit Josh McDaniels for staying with him. So they get to third and one. Max Crosby stops Melvin Gordon, hammers him, strips the ball loose, fumble. Ball's on the ground, but the Broncos recover. Okay, so that was on third and one, remember. So a huge, huge stop for that defense. That alone would have been great. Denver kicks a field goal. You're down 13-7. It's still only a one-score game. But that's not where we end, <laughs> right? You guys know this, but it's, it's worth reliving because fourth down, Brandon Manis comes out, sets up for a 25-yard field goal. So Denver's going to get that 13-7 lead. Max Crosby, two straight plays, makes plays of the game. The fumble to stop them on third and one. Then he blocks the field goal. He blocks the field goal. And I'm here to tell you that that was the turning point in this game. Absolutely 100% bona fide game-changing moment. And it was created by the Raiders' defense. Who would have thought? From everything I hear from you guys, that, that was surprising to you as well. But this defense, the Raiders' defense set the tone in this win. And not only did this one play change this game and change the momentum on the back of Max Crosby making those two plays, the third and one forced fumble and stop, and then the fourth down field goal block to keep it at a three-point game at halftime. But this might have changed the trajectory of the season. Again, I'm not going to go on, I'm not going to go out here and tell you the Raiders are making the playoffs. I do not believe they will. If you do great, I want you to be positive, cool. I don't think so. But what this team needs, and I've been saying it for 2 weeks on this show, is this team needs confidence. It needs to see the work it's putting in is benefiting them and is resulting in what their ultimate goal is, and that's winning ball games. So the Raiders' defense set the tone before the end of the first half, and in doing so, not only did they change the course of this game, which they then came back and won 22-16 to on the road in Denver, which is hard to do for them, but they may have changed the tone of the season, the tone of how the fan base and some look at Josh McDaniels, the tone and how the fan base looks at Derek Carr. That's wishful thinking, I know. Half of you won't be convinced no matter what. But nonetheless, it changes minds. In my view, it changes the direction of this team if they can build. Now, they have to build on this and then go to Seattle and play consistently and do what they did in Denver there, okay? But I believe the Raiders' defense, of all, of all the units you would have thought, may have changed the tone and direction of the rest of this season. And if that's the case, then we start talking about all different things, right? The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Patrick Graham getting fired, even though I never thought it was a good idea or that it would happen. You guys all wanted Josh McDaniels. I shouldn't say you guys all. I should say a lot of you wanted Josh McDaniels fired. A lot of you wanted Derek Carr gone. And I believed, based on his play up to this point, full transparency, that I thought that the divorce between the Raiders and Derek Carr would come at the end of the season, and it was gaining more steam and certainty because he was not playing up to his ability or how he's played in the past. He didn't look comfortable. And again, we're going to talk about that next segment, about Derek Carr and the offense particularly. But this defense, Max Crosby, I mean, we got to read this. Six tackles, two tackles for losses, three quarterback hits, a forced fumble, and a field goal block. Listen, Max Crosby is a leader of men. We talked about that. You guys have been using that terminology and saying that Josh McDaniels is not that. And that's a separate conversation later in the show on the coaching situation. But Max Crosby's not an in-your-face, going to call people out type of leader. He leads by example. 
yes, he gets fired up. If you watch the Twitter video after the game, <laughs> uh, fun times for Max there. But listen, they talked about it. Tashawn Reed on The Athletic had a story about Deron Harmon and talked about how there was not enough intensity and enough excitement on that defense. He challenged. The leadership of that defense challenged. So what did you see on Sunday? You saw on Sunday Denzel Perryman, like he was possessed, Exorcist Part 4, came out and balled out, had a great game. He set the tone. Max Crosby set the tone. And then the defensive backs, they didn't play a perfect game, but they were resilient. They stayed in the game. They kept the game close enough. And yes, the Broncos' offense sucks. Okay, so I'm not saying the Raiders' defensive backs deserve some sort of award for what they did, but they played with resilience and they kept mistakes to a minimum. Okay, so you did that, and that's what gave you a chance. But Max Crosby, what he was able to do is remarkable. Seven quarterback hits in the second half, the pass rush was consistent. And again, the DBs held their own. Seven quarterback hits in the second half. Cleland Farrell did well. Bilal Nichols had a couple big, big plays. So you see this D suddenly something turned on. Now, I'm not, I'm not writing home to you guys telling you the Raiders are a playoff team or that they're done or everything is solved, because it's not. But what I will tell you is. Mo and I consistently for a month have been saying this team just needs some positive momentum. They need to see what they're doing is working. I know everyone hates the trust the process statement, but all of the things that they did, the system, the practice regimen, the psychology, the buy-in, all of that had to come together and result in positivity. As human beings, we react to that negativity yeah, we can be challenged. It can help us spurn forward. But overall, the best way you get people to perform is showing them that the work they put in is appreciated and that it benefits everyone involved and it generates a positive outcome, right? So on Sunday in Denver, we saw a positive outcome. We saw the defense to a man come alive. Did they make mistakes? Absolutely. Was there blown coverages? Absolutely. There was. I'm not saying this is the best defense in the NFL all of a sudden. I'm just saying positive momentum. And yes, I know you guys are out there, some of you saying, well, we want a better draft pick. It's about winning the game. These are professionals. There's no tanking. There's letting young guys give an opportunity. We saw that yesterday. Okay excuse me, on Sunday. But if you see that, that's great. But what I'm saying is this team will still draft in the top 10, 15-ish, my guess, okay? But there's a lot of things that I saw happen in Denver that if you're a Raiders fan, even if you're a jaded Raiders fan, you should feel good about because at the end of the day, firing a coach and blowing everybody out again is not optimal. No matter whether you like Josh McDaniels, whether you can tell me on Twitter that you never wanted him hired and you told everybody they shouldn't hire him, I'm not saying you didn't. All I'm saying is the reality of the situation is he's there, he's not going anywhere. So if that's the case, what do you want? Do you want to just bitch and complain about everything? Or do you want to see your team do better? I know Raider Nation now, covering it for six seasons. I know Raider Nation loves their team. There's no more passionate fan base in all of sports. And if that's the case, then you want them to win and you want to see progress. So Denver on Sunday, you saw progress. That defense led the way thanks to Max Crosby, Denzel Perryman, Deron Harmon. These guys all had better intensity and better energy. And guess what happened? They had better results. It's hard to argue with it, right? I mean, that's that's what happened. So to me, that's what you want. If you're a Raiders fan, okay, fine. You you this team needs draft picks. They got to build the roster. They're not near where they need to be to win a championship. We know that. But if you want a quarterback, yeah, top five. But do you need a quarterback? We'll talk about that in the next segment because. A lot of you want a, new, a young quarterback. I think the Raiders have to get a young quarterback because they need to think past Derek Carr. But does that mean Carr's gone? 
We'll talk about that in the next segment and why I think the wind has blown the other way very quickly on whether Derek Carr will be a Raider next year with that out in the contract, no matter how heavy the trade market could be. Maybe their mind will change, but I doubt it. But we'll talk about that when we come back. But just an amazing performance due to what they have been under, I should say, due to what has been happening around this defense. For them to come out and set the tone for that win was huge, and it should not be overlooked. All right, we're going to step aside for our first break. When we come back, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about the offense. Oh, you know what, though? I have to do one thing before we go. Josh McDaniels talked about, now I made the premise at the beginning of this segment about that ending first half sequence of the Raiders defense against the Broncos offense and blocking the field goal, the Max Crosby series, I'll call it from now on, uh, the importance of that and how it changed the tone of the game. Josh McDaniels talked about that in his press conference after the game, too. Here's what he had to say. I thought there was a lot of energy. Um, you know, we've been working really hard. We've been close on a couple of kicks um, in the last few weeks here, and the guys work really hard in practice of trying to get that done. And we know that those plays make a huge difference, as you can see. I mean, if you, if you don't block that field goal, then we have to score a touchdown at the end of regulation. Uh, so I thought it was an enormous play. I thought it gave our group, we had great energy as it was, but I thought the energy, you know, coming into the halftime was, was really good. Um, I think they were focused on trying to play their best half in the second half. Um, but I thought it definitely gave us a little bit of a boost there. So there you go, making my point. And his point, I forgot to mention that, about how if, if, you, if they get a field goal there, then you got to get a touchdown at the end of the game to win. So... All of you who've been screaming on Twitter about how defense, 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 you're right. But you don't have to have a top 10 defense like the Broncos did. Broncos have a top 10 defense, but it all comes back to complementary football. The Raiders, for the first time all season, I think throughout the game, had complementary football yesterday. Excuse me, Sunday. I keep saying yesterday. Feels like yesterday. I guess when it's a win, it's a little more enjoyable, so you think of it. <laughs> more recently. But anyway, that was Josh McDaniels on that and agree with him 100%. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk about the offense. Derek Carr, who looked comfortable for once as the quarterback of the Raiders in 2022. We'll talk about that and uh, get to some of my thoughts around that. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you don't do it. And we will be right back after this message here on Silver and Black Today and Odyssey Original. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition. Hope you're having a good day and a good start to this short week for most of us, right? Thanksgiving coming up on Thursday. My birthday's on Friday. When you get to be my age, eh, you're happy to be alive, but it's not as much as a celebration of when I was in my 20s. Uh, but we're certainly uh, hoping and wishing for you all to have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We will have our mailbag show tomorrow. And then we will have our normally scheduled show on Thursday on Thanksgiving. So as you get ready to watch some of the other teams in the NFL and spend some time with the turkey and whatever else you might be eating, uh, in my food we have a little uh, Cuban food as well. So we have a mixture of cultural delights, if you will, uh, with my wife being Cuban. So it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to that. But as you do that, you can listen to Silver and Black today. Uh, Mo will be back for that show on Thursday, by the way. He's... Uh, He's gotten better and doing really, really well. He's doing his work at Bleacher Report, but he'll be back here on Silver and Black today on Thursday. So we're excited to get him back, as I know you all are. But there'll be a show on Thursday, on Thanksgiving as well. And then, of course, the Raiders in Seattle on Sunday, and we'll have our postgame show after the 1.25 p.m. West Coast start. So I would say probably somewhere around 4.30 uh, or 5 o'clock, maybe a little bit later, um, uh, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the West Coast, excuse me, after the game. So we'll figure that out, but we will be back with you. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you already don't do it. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. Hit the notifications bell. Hit the notification bell. Hit the notifications bell. Because <laughs> if you don't get that, then you won't get a notification when there's a new video up like this one. So we appreciate that. Uh, follow us on Twitter, SNB Today. Also, you can follow me on Twitter, at LV Gully. And, of course, Mo is at Mo Moten, at M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. So follow us there. We love interacting with you guys. All right, I want to jump into this second segment and talk about Derek Carr. Um, I have not been hard on Derek Carr. I think I've been fair on Derek Carr this year. He wasn't performing at the level we saw him perform last year. A lot of you uh, surmise that that was all Josh McDaniel's fault. 
and I think it was partially, no doubt about it. Uh, and also the rest of you thought that Derek Carr sucks and he should never be a quarterback. So, you know, it's, it's tough to find the in-between. Mo and I always tend to be in the in-between, which is good quarterback, does have deficiencies. This year, I thought that the play calling has not been good. We're going to talk about that in the last segment, by the way, about the coaching and some of the things happening around that. But also, uh, Derek Carr just hasn't looked comfortable. He also has only had 62 snaps, not making excuses, clear, clear distinction, but 62 snaps with all of his offensive tools, which is Devontae Adams, which is Darren Waller, Hunter Renfro. Okay, those three guys have only been on the field together for 62 snaps. So, but it's the NFL, injuries happen. Quarterbacks have to overcome that. It's not an excuse. You have to figure out ways to get it done. Early in the game on Sunday in Denver, you heard the commentators on Fox talk about how Derek Carr and his receivers didn't seem to be, with the exception of Devontae Adams, didn't seem to be on the same page. There's disconnect. They're not in a rhythm. They're not getting like, they're not getting the vibe. I agree 100%. We've seen that all year. Not only that, but we saw Derek Carr, I think, with the exception of a quarter here, a quarter there, we saw Derek Carr really not look comfortable in the pocket, not look comfortable at all. And yes, was some of that running that offense and, and the new offense? I think a little bit of it was, but you're a nine-year veteran. You, you, And he's been through so much change that I think it, it should take you less time, in my view. But... If you don't have the freedom to change the calls to audible and the coach is insisting you run certain plays, then it's kind of out of your hands. And, and Derek Carr said that in previous press conferences, right? Hey, I do what Josh tells me to do, which is a little bit different than the relationship him and Gruden had. So, so with that said, Derek Carr just, he wasn't, and I think, I think Rich Gannon said it best. He said, he's not playing bad, but he's not playing great. He was kind of in between inconsistent. Well, in Denver, I saw something very encouraging if you're a Raiders fan, and that is Derek Carr, for the first time in 2022, looked comfortable throughout the game. He looked like he, he knew where things were going. Yes, his receivers were not clicking with him, and, and when you saw him throw a pass to a receiver who went the wrong direction or whatever, um, you could see he was upset, but, but just he realized what happened. So he didn't get down on himself. He didn't do any of that. Then... I got a little worried because the first half, it looks great, comes out 12 to 24 in the first half, has a great first half, right? The touchdown pass to Adams early on. Comes out in the third quarter, and boy, it seemed like he wasn't out of sync per se. It just wasn't good, right? I think it was three of seven or something, two or seven to start, oh, for something to start. I think it was oh, oh for five to start, and then two for seven, three for seven, as time went on in the third quarter, they again get goose-egged in the third quarter. They score no points in the third quarter again. So that happens. And I was thinking, oh boy, man, is he is he not going to be able to do this? Is he going to is he going to revert back? But the one thing I noticed, even when that was happening, was again, he looked comfortable. He looked as though he was in charge. And didn't have doubts. Like I didn't see doubt on his. I've seen other games this year, and I'm sure you all have too, where it just didn't appear to me that Derek Carr was confident in himself or in his team, especially with the, some of these late game drives when they got the ball back with a chance to win or tie the game. I just didn't see it. Like there was something, and we've been saying it here on the show. There's just something not right there. Well. Sunday in Denver, it seemed right again. It seemed like 2021 Derek Carr during that run was back. He just had that swagger. If Derek Carr can have a swagger, <laughs> he's a humble dude, so it's a little bit different. But he looked comfortable for the first time, and, and I love that. It was, it was important because all the talk, and I've said it, I thought that this team and Derek Carr were headed towards a divorce. But if he plays like he played on Sunday in Denver and continues to do that, then I would agree with my broadcast friend, Mo Moten, who's been very vocal on the web this week saying that Derek Carr will be back. He has no doubt Derek Carr will be back. I still have some doubts, but they were lessened on Sunday in Denver. I really saw Derek Carr turn it around. And I want to go back to what happened last week. The Derek Carr press conference, the emotional press conference where he broke down. A lot of people criticized him for it. But I think, and even Rich Eisen called it, you know, the Raiders have have 
broken or crushed, whatever the word he used, Derek Carr. And you know what? Sometimes, and I think you can relate to this as as a person out there, as as a viewer, as a listener, sometimes you get to rock bottom at a place to, to see what's wrong and to find the nugget you need to then jump forward, right? Because you keep falling back, falling back. We all fall down every day, okay? And Derek Carr got to that point after nine and a half years, he finally just broke. He just broke down. Broke down. And maybe that's the best thing that's ever happened to him because the response from him and his teammates, again, Derek Carr, not the guy who's going to call people out, He's not going to yell at people. He's not an Aaron Rodgers, right? But that locker room after the game, a lot of people making a lot about that video, including journalists saying, look, you think, you know, you think Derek Carr lost the locker room? Look at this. I don't put, I mean, listen, it was a great win. And I, I believe the players like Derek Carr. I'm not saying that, but it's also Raider video. It's not, it's, it's state run media. Okay. But it did show the jubilation. It showed them rally around the quarterback. And I think the breakdown Last week, with Derek Carr on the podium, his teammates saw that. And, well, some of you might say, oh, his teammates now, they think he's this or think he's that, he's not tough, blah, blah, blah. I think it had the opposite effect. I think Derek Carr breaking down was his magnus, magnum opus moment as a leader. Now, again, we all react differently to different types of leaders. Derek Carr, that's, that's, he did, by being vulnerable in that moment and being emotional, he showed leadership. And I don't, you know, I, again, I know some of you will never like Derek Carr and you want them to move on, and that's totally fine. It's a valid point, not an issue. But I'm just telling you what I saw. If you don't like it, I don't care. But I'm just telling you, I think the vulnerability, his emotion, it showed how much he cared about him, his, his team and his teammates, and that he wanted more from them. And sometimes, you know, you need to see somebody, whoa, and say, man, I don't want my guy to feel that way. I got to pick up. I got I to gotta look in the mirror. How much of this do I own? And if I own a lot of that, then I got to pick it up and do something about it. And I think that's what happened. So you have the breakdown moment. Carr comes out and plays his best, most complete game of the year. He's had moments, don't get me wrong, where he's been on fire. But I thought that game. And then the calmness of him coming back in that fourth quarter. And I know all the stats, Derek Carr, fourth quarter comebacks. I, it, to me, I get it. It's, it's kind of cool. It's one of those stats that seems really impressive. But yesterday's comeback, Sunday's comeback, was, was remarkable. And he did it, and he looked calm. He didn't have happy feet. He stayed in the pocket. The pass to Devontae Adams to end the game, the 35-yarder, um, he had a guy come in on the backside of his pressure, another second and a half, and who knows what happens. But it doesn't matter. That's the game of football. Derek Carr stuck in there. The other thing I want to say about that, which will lead us into the next segment a little bit, which is Carr mentioned in the press conference, and I want to, I want to get to this um, in a second, but first I want to play about Derek Carr's performance. You know, th- there's been a lot said about Derek Carr and Josh McDaniels and whether or not they're getting along, they're on the same page. I don't think they've been completely on the same page. Not that they haven't been trying or not that one side's angry and doesn't want to work with the other. I don't think that's true. But I don't think it's clicked for them either. But I think it clicked yesterday in the fourth quarter. Sunday in the fourth quarter, <laughs> excuse me. Can't keep track of my days anymore. It's a quick holiday week. But... If you listen to McDaniel's post-game press conference talking about Carr, um, you can gleam some of that here. And I I want you to play this because there's some significant moments here where he talks about Carr having a conversation with him going out for that last drive. Here's Josh McDaniels on Derek Carr's performance Sunday in Denver. Derek's, I mean, Derek, there's a lot of things that Derek does well. He's been in the game for a while. And, um, you know, whatever the situation has been, it doesn't seem to rattle him at all, you know, and, we go take the field with one minute 40 and, you know, we know I, he asked me before the drive, he said, what, you know, what are you thinking specifically? And I said, we need probably two chunk plays, you know what I mean? To give Daniel a chance. And uh, I said, but don't, don't be careless with the ball. We don't need to, you know, panic or hurry. We got a lot of time left, you know, cause when they threw that incompletion, it gave us another, I don't know, 40 seconds or so. So we, we didn't have to rush as much as we would have probably had to um, if it had been under a minute. So, um, he was out. He went out there with poise in the first play. I think he threw it to JJ on the sideline, and then 
you know, hit Keelan on the in cut, you know, and he trusts, he trusts the play, you know, and, and he's not trying to force it to one guy. And I think they covered Tay pretty good on that, that in cut to Keelan. And then he goes right to his next read, you know, and then the next play goes to JJ down the sideline. And so I thought he, I thought he played with great poise, uh, took care of the ball, uh, no turnovers again. And that's always a good philosophy. So there you go. A couple key things there. One was where he talked about the conversation going out for the last drive and McDaniels tells Carr, hey, we need a couple of chunk plays. So that sets the expectation between the coach and the quarterback, right? We can't get two, three yard dump off passes. We got to go downfield to have a chance to win this game, Derek. We got to have yardage. We got to get downfield. So, of course, he gets the pass to Josh Jacobs. And then you see later on what's happening there, and they they start to open it up. The Foster Moreau later on in overtime, but in that play too, you get it to Cole. So so they 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 talk about that, right? So it gives you a little insight. I know it seems like nothing when you watch the press conference, but that was important. That set the expectation of what they wanted to do. So quarterback and coach are on the same page because that's what happened. Then he talked about the importance there of staying and trusting the play. You heard him say that, right? Trust the play. Derek trusted the play. Okay. So maybe what we saw in, in some of these losses and some of these terrible segments of play over the last 10 games has been maybe that trust. And I talked about it on the postgame show with Murph. You have to have trust. Any relationship, coach, boss, significant other, you have to have trust. And Sometimes that takes time to build. It doesn't, you just walk in, I trust you. Hey man, it's great. No, you, you, you have a mindset. You've been doing things a certain way. Derek Carr has been, he was under John Gruden. He was under Jack Del Rio going all the way back. He's had all those systems. So trust takes time. And they thought they could get that trust sooner and it hasn't. But the statements that he made there to me shows a breakthrough. I know it's just a little thing and you might've missed it when you watched it on Sunday. But to me, it's a big deal. And I think that's important to point out that finally, maybe Josh McDaniels has listened to his quarterback because the play calling in the fourth quarter, a hundred times better than it was in the third or even the second. They really adjusted well. That's a huge sign too. If you don't like Josh McDaniels and you don't give him credit for that late in the game, then you're not being honest with yourself. So, so to me, that's a big deal. And I'm going to play one more clip here before we go to the break. And it's Derek Carr talking as well about the end of the game and just in general about what how this team felt about itself after this win. We've been so close so many times. Uh, I mean, y'all know, you've been watching us the whole time. And, and we're a few plays there, a few plays there. And um, I think our guys learned how hard it is, you know, like this is the kind of effort and strain it takes. Uh, you know, Josh did a great job of helping minimize, you know, certain things to help us as a team and just to help us be better. And, um, you know, and that, that's a big loaded question. I wouldn't write about it. You know, there's so much in that, you know. But I'm just saying, like, I think that we all found a way um, to play better, to do our job um, at a high level. And it won't be perfect. We're going to turn the film on. I'll be corrected. Tay will be corrected. Everyone will be corrected. And uh, I think that that's the culture that we want to, uh, you know, believe in. And it's culture that Josh brings. It's awesome, you know. Like, he hasn't changed, and he won't change when we watch the film after this, you know. Uh, he's going to be the same, and I think that's something that we appreciate. But I think it's something that guys are learning that, man, if I, man, if I really just do A, B, and C when I'm asked every week, man, we have a chance to win. And then it comes down to just making the plays at the end, and um, that ultimately comes down to just do your job. Take a breath, like Tay was talking about. Take a breath. The situation doesn't matter. What matters is you do your job. You know. So when you turn the tape on, so I think um, the feeling in there is a result of so much, um, so much work, right? Our owner came out and said, guys, trust the process, you know, however he wants to say it. You know, that's how I, I'm a, you know, Embiid fan, so I always think about that, you know. But, you know, trust the process, you know, it didn't, it's not going to get done in one day, but hopefully we're taking steps in the right direction so that, you know, there isn't, you know, new players and new coaches every two or three years here. You know, we're trying to sustain something here, and hopefully guys um, see that, man, when we do those things right, that it leads to. There you go. So Derek Carr there, see, the trust, the pro. This is what I said in the first segment here on the show, which is 
you trust the process, but until you see the result, it's hard. And so sometimes you lose your way, you fall back. And I think that's what's happened with the Raiders. But I think they've turned a corner. I really do believe they've turned a corner here for the rest of the season. Again, not saying they're going to the playoffs or they're going to win 15 games or anything because they can't now. But nonetheless, a big corner and a big milestone, I think, for this team. That's why that win felt so good to them. And it's a big deal for you in Raider Nation. All right, we're going to step aside for our final break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about Josh McDaniels, his adjustment, what he's done, the abuse he's taken, not only from all of you guys and us, me included, uh, but also the national media. And if that attitude may change now, if they can string this together, uh, especially after that big win. We'll also hear from Devontae Adams about uh, the big catch and what he was doing there. I want to just revisit that one, too, because I love to hear Devontae so quiet and well-spoken, but uh, just so casual. He's so talented and amazing uh, and set some records again uh, on Sunday, so we'll get to that as well. You're listening to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast. Don't go anywhere, Rainer Nation. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Home stretch here on a Tuesday, Silver and Black uh, today edition of our Odyssey original podcast. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe if you have not already done so. Turn on auto download. Same on YouTube. Hit subscriptions and notifications. Thanks for being with us. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, so thanks again for doing that. All right. Well, it's been a good week, Raider Nation. Sunday, you win. You get to you got to roll into work yesterday on Monday feeling pretty good about yourself, especially if you work with any Broncos fans. Um, and, of course, uh, you saw what happened with the Chargers. Pretty crazy. That game on Sunday night was pretty good. Uh, but nonetheless, here we are, and we are talking about Raiders football. And uh, just a reminder, tomorrow we'll have our mailbag show. And on Thursday, Thanksgiving, yes, we will give you a feast of Raiders football. Mo Moten and myself back for our normal Thursday edition of the show. So please join us as well. And also a big thanks out to all of you who I know will be working on Thanksgiving. Yes, a lot of the retail stores finally got their wits about them and have closed uh, so that people can be with their families. But I do know uh, my wife's family worked in Las Vegas in casinos her entire life, had to work all sorts of holidays. And so I know firsthand how that is for families. So all of you in the service industry, medical industry, first responders, all the folks that are out there that are going to be working on Thanksgiving, I just want to say thank you for all you do, and we appreciate you and your efforts, and hopefully you will have the time on Wednesday or Friday to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving with your family. My favorite holiday, by the way. It's just such an American holiday, uh, and I love it, and it means a lot to me. Uh, my birthday's also right around it, so it kind of makes it cool. But uh, we appreciate it and hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving. But we will be back and talk to you on Thanksgiving, so we'll talk to you then as well. All right, for this final segment, I just want to address a little bit of, listen, I've been hard on Josh McDaniels. All of you have been with good reason. This team has come out flat. He's been outcoached. The, 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 the loss of huge leads, the 17 to nothing leads, going back to the Arizona game, all of these things have to be at the feet of Josh McDaniels. He is the head coach. The buck stops there. So this past week, after the loss to Jeff Saturday, which was the ultimate loss, right? If you're an NFL coach, especially people already down on you and on the teams calling it the most disappointing team of the, of the season. But the national narrative blasted. I mean, full blast. Even on our own network here in Odyssey, you saw the extra bonus episodes of other podcasts. They sweep, they sweep into our feed, uh, NFL podcast. People saying Josh McDaniels is awful. He's terrible. He should be fired. Mark Davis is an idiot for hiring him. He has no business being a head coach. And that comes, too, from people who are very qualified, who I trust, who have said, look, I don't know if he's the right guy to coach a team. He's a great offensive coordinator, kind of the Norv Turner type where he's brilliant at offense, but he's not the kind of guy who runs the organization because you, you have to be a CEO as a head coach. So that was the national narrative. It still is. I mean, the win over the Broncos is not going to change that for the near term. But is he going to earn some more respect? Because at least for people in the know. If you just watch football casually or you're just a, a fan and you just watch the games and that's it for you, fine. But if you look back at the film, as I did, and the adjustments they made second half, but more so the fourth quarter, it really was good. 
And and listen, Josh McDaniels has a long way to go to prove himself with this team. And he's going to get that chance. He's not going to get fired. No matter what anybody says, I don't care if you're Rich Eisen, whoever, you're not getting, he's not getting fired. So you look at that and you say, okay, you saw him. Just like we talked about earlier in the rest of the show, the team needed positive momentum. They needed to take steps forward to show that they were progressing. Because all we've seen is regression before. So when it came to the coaching, two things. Let's start on the defense. Patrick Graham's system, complex, blah, blah, blah. I saw progress there. Baby step. But a big baby step. The way the defense, as we said at the beginning of the show, turned this game around at the end of the first half. Absolutely did. No question. So Patrick Graham did better. He's using his players better. They're getting more familiar with the system. Unfortunately, it's just taken 10 games. So you have that. Then you look on the offensive side of the ball. And here's the thing. What happened on the last play to Devontae Adams? He was wide. How did he get wide open? Did somebody fall down? No. What happened was Denver had seen that route throughout the whole game. The difference was they sent another receiver a different way, put a wrinkle in it, and that freed up Adams because Sertan bit on the upside on the top side a pie that left Devontae Adams wide open for the game-winning touchdown. And again, I'm going to play Devontae Adams now because he talks about it in this clip and says something very specific there. And this, this, this is coaching. Yes, it's the receiver. Don't get me wrong. Devontae Adams still has to sell it. But this is coaching. Here's Devontae Adams. Um, just, just selling. I mean, a lot of route running is really just about, um, you know, the sameness within each route. You know, if they see something that was very similar. Um, so I try to give a look that basically – um, you know, that's why he ended up diving over the top the way that he did. He thought he was on top of the, you know, he thought he had a, a jump on it, basically. And, uh, you know, based off of what I'd seen earlier, I mentioned the coach, I think we could be able to do this and, you know, um, you know, obviously not force anything, but if, if it presents itself, we, we'd have a home run. And sure enough, as soon as I go inside, he, he starts, you know, flying over the top. And um, as soon as I saw him go, I just said, please, God, Give that man some time back there, a little, little bit of time. I don't need much right now, but a little bit of time. And as soon as I looked, I saw the ball go up, and it was a touchdown. I love that. Just give the man a bit of time, Derek Carr, of course. And he got just enough time, if you've seen the clip. Uh, but important designation there was he talked about route running and how you do it and how he's got to sell it, no question. But what happened? He, they ran that route all game. Sometimes he was double teamed, sometimes no. But what happened is coaching, they made a different call knowing that Adams would run the same route that the defense and Patrick Sertan had seen all game. But they brought the other receiver on the other side, I think it was Mac Hollins, because they figured, well, if he bites, then that's going to leave Devontae Adams because they thought the play was going there. So he goes there and frees him up. So Josh McDaniels, Deserves credit. That is exactly what you would expect from him and what he did in, in, in uh, New England. But that's coaching. It's it, Yes, it's great receiving. It's great route running by Adams to make sure the defensive back is buying what he's selling. But at the same time, you got to give McDaniels credit. You got to. Because at that at the biggest moment of the game, he called the right play. Now, you could say, well, even a squirrel finds a nut now and then, a blind squirrel, that is. But in this case, again, the fourth quarter, that drive, the drive previous to it, to get the field goal to tie the game was better. Now, all these, these screen plays at, uh, or the run plays on third and 29, those drove me nuts in the first half. I was, I was livid just watching. I was like, why are you doing? And I saw a lot of you saying the same thing. But again, you got to give credit where credit is due. And Josh McDaniels in the fourth quarter, to me, really called his best offensive schemes of the season. And that's why I say you, you piece together what I talked about in the first segment on the, on the defense. Piece together what I said in the second segment on Derek Carr and the offense. And make no bones about it. The NFL is a quarterback league. Your quarterback has to play at a very high level if you're going to win football games. Ask the New York Jets. Whew, tough one, right? That's why you're seeing Jet fans now tweeting out pictures of Photoshop Derek Carr in a Jets jersey. Oh, crazy times we live in. So 
again, that and then coaching the third piece. That's why I structured the show the way I did it today. Defense, offense, coaching. Now, again, everything perfect? No, no. Long way to go. But is it a breakthrough? It, have they turned the corner? Perhaps. I think they have for now. Now, Sunday, it all starts anew. Sunday, they're in Seattle. Not an easy place to play. They're going to have to go there and win. And I want to see the same thing we saw against Denver. Even if they somehow happen to lose a close one. If they do what they did in Denver, then again, it's po progress. But you saw the, the jubilation in that locker room afterwards, that video that was circulating online from the Raiders. That's because... You put in all the hard work, and I know you guys have all been in there. No matter what you do for a living or if you're in school, you study really hard and you, you fail a test, you get a C on a test, you get a D on a test, and then you have a breakthrough and you succeed and it changes your whole perspective. Same thing in sports or in business. You might be at your job, working hard, working hard, not recognized, not recognized, not getting the promotion, not getting the bonus. And then suddenly it breaks through and you're like, oh, it was all worth it. It really sucked last time. But right now, I'm starting to see the fruits of my labor. And that's where the Raiders are at. And all you can hope for and wish for is that they can continue and carry that momentum forward against the Seahawks. If they do that against the Seahawks, then you really can start to see things change. Could the Raiders whittle off three or four wins in a row? They could. We'll have to see. I'm not getting there yet myself, but if they can go to Seattle, take care of business, then suddenly I think you're in a much better place, okay? So that's what I would say you take away from this game. I think there has been a corner turned in the locker room for those players. It looks as though, jury out a little bit, that that happened too with Josh McDaniels late in that game. Sometimes a singular moment or a singular situation can change the perspectives of both parties. Maybe the coaching player trust issue has now started to gel and has started to change. And so this team was able to perform at a high stress, in this high stress environment at the right moment towards the end of the game. Maybe that's what we saw. If that's what we saw, then watch out. That's a great thing. And I think that that's what you have to look for as the Raiders prepare for their next game. But I just, you know, again, no game is perfect. It's for fans. I know out there it's emotional, not as emotional for me, but I see you tweeting during the games where it's like from heaven to hell in like two minutes. And I get it. Hey, that's why you guys are so passionate and that's cool. But uh, I really believe that that there was a breakthrough with this team. Now, hopefully they don't prove me wrong <laughs> next week in Seattle coming up on Sunday. But last Sunday... It was a good one, and you guys should have enjoyed it. So uh, it's all good, but but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But all of you out there should should at least find some solace in the fact that this team appears it's headed in the right direction. This could be the corner that was turned, as I said before. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for this Tuesday edition of Silver and Black today. Remember, we do a post-game show, live post-game show. You can also listen to it. Uh, on Monday morning uh, in audio, whether you're taking the train or driving to work in the morning. If you don't catch us live on Sunday night, you can do that. But then we also publish Tuesday, this show, and then Wednesday, our mailbag show, where you write in questions to mail at silverandblacktoday.com, mail at silverandblacktoday.com. If you have questions or comments, uh, we Mo and I take those. We make a show out of it on Wednesday, give you a voice and answer your questions. Always a great time. We love doing that. And then Thursday, we have our show kind of focuses on the news of the week, but also looking forward to the game ahead, which again is against the Seattle Seahawks. So we'll do that on Thursday. For your Thanksgiving day, you will have a brand new episode as well. Uh, for my co-host, Mo Moten, who will be back on Thursday, we appreciate you being with us. I am Scott Branson. Uh, please follow me on Twitter at LV Gully. Also the show at SNB Today. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, thank you again uh, for listening to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast. Have a great week. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Take care.